Good morning, everybody. Um, my name's Dermot Ryan. I'm an associate professor of English at Loyola Marymount University. Um, my, I specialize in the long 18th century, uh, print culture in the long 18th century. And today, um, Melanie and I are going to be talking about um, our efforts to collaborate as a faculty member, as a professor of English, and as a librarian to foster uh, digital humanities uh, at Loyola, at LMU, um, so at a, kind, at a university which is very focused on under edu undergraduate education um, that has many of the trademarks of uh, a liberal arts college um, and how you do, so basically our challenge was how do you get from zero where there's no digital humanities presence on campus to having some sort of uh, DH community um, and how do you do that when you yourself have no institutional or professional training in digital humanities? Um, and um, I think it's worth remembering, like for me, what my initial interest in, in digital humanities was very much from the perspective of a, of a traditional scholar. Um, like I, I looked at Echo and I was like, oh my Lord, there's a whole set of questions I've wanted to answer uh, that I couldn't answer, uh, that I can now answer using that tool. And uh, to give you a very specific example, um, uh, I'm an Edmund Burke, I, I work on Edmund Burke, and I had a theory that Edmund Burke, uh, Edmund Burke introduces the idea of um, the universal empire of the regicide republic of France, and I had a theory that he was using the word universal empire to tap into an anti-Catholic prejudice about Louis XIV, because uh, that, that, that phrase circulated in the 1740s. And I, I was like, I bet you he's introduced that, uh, and I bet you I can show that. Uh, I, I can show that there was a, uh, a certain instance, number of instances of that, frequency of uh, references that in the 1740s, 1730s, 40s. It disappears and it comes back in the 1790s and goes viral. Uh, and Echo allowed me to test that hypothesis and make an argument. And so for me, a lot of people's interest in digital humanities is, is coming it answers questions that we've always had as, as scholars. Um, uh, so, and I was also interested in sort of, anybody who works in the print culture of the long 18th century can see there's some really interesting parallels between the use of uh, print writing as a kind of social networking device in the 18th century and uh, the way we're building social media platforms. Um, but my, what, what you know? What, me got, what got me talking to, to Melanie was um, my work as the director of undergraduate research, as the director of the Office of Undergraduate Research, and my recognition as director of undergraduate research how far behind uh, undergraduate students in the humanities fell behind uh, those in the social sciences and in the hard sciences in terms of participation in undergraduate research, and there's a lot of scholarship explaining why that is. Uh, and there's, there's legitimate reasons why it's very hard for faculty and students in the humanities to do research based on our work has traditionally been non-collaborative. It's, it's been, you know, we don't tend to work as scholars in teams. There's a high entry level there in, in, into scholarship in the humanities. Um, there's very little incentive for uh, faculty in the humanities often. Often you a student comes to you with, a, with their project, which, ha, which has very little to do with your particular speciality. Somebody work, wants to work with me in, the, in romanticism, but doesn't want to work in the area of romanticism that will benefit my scholarship, but I'm happy to mentor it for one semester, but that's not going to be an ongoing relationship. I have to work on my own scholarship. That's not the way it works in the sciences at LMU. At LMU, the faculty there in the sciences need undergraduates to get their work done. Um, so, if you look at, if you, you know, as I looked at digital humanities pro projects, I realized, um, well, there's, it answers a number of challenges we have in the humanities to getting undergraduates involved in research. You could actually have a research project that's your own, that's a faculty or a, a group of faculty, and get students involved. Um, you can parcel up part re research in the way that traditionally we've had a hard time doing. So, there's a, so for us, so for me, and this is an example of just how vivid that discrepancy between, um, you know, if you look at this graph, um, BCLA, the humanities are part of the liberal arts college at, at LMU, and, and BCLA is always talking about how great 
research, we, you know, our research, the, the, the number of uh, students in, at BCLA, is, 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 that's a fairly reasonable chunk. But if you take the social sciences out of there, suddenly you see how poor humanities undergraduates are performing. Um, so seeing that you know, a DH presence on our campus could really foster undergraduate research was what got Melly and I talking. This actually started through an email where um, Dermot mentioned something about digital humanities and that was really exciting for me because I wanted somebody on campus to partner with because I felt as though we could never get started, whether that, you know, the library couldn't necessarily launch this without, you know, interested uh, stakeholders. Um, so we identified, you know, we worked together, to, we realized that we have, you know, certain levels of knowledge and we have similar professional goals, uh, institutional goals, um, and we had a desire to build a DH community on campus. Um, and of course, we were both concerned with undergraduate research and, and how to incorporate this in the classroom because this is a teaching university. And we decided we needed to start small um, and start with maybe a single class, some exercises. Um, and for me, that seemed perfectly reasonable. I knew that we weren't gonna launch some giant DH project. We have, some, we have a wonderful Department of Archives and Special Collections, and I, I'm, at some point we may be able to tap into that. And I'm closely connected with that department in my role as a digital scholarship librarian. Um, but I, I felt like we just needed to sort of experiment um, and, and Dermot agreed. Um, we actually worked with a student um, in the form of an independent study where we did some, you know, talking. We'd meet, what, every other week, I think. Um, we'd try a tool out, we'd talk about issues, and, and by doing this, we were able to, to identify things that may work in a course. Um, so once we established these kinds of things, we came up with some objectives and outcomes, or desired outcomes, um, and, and the objecti objectives are somewhat, they're not really lofty, but they're, they're larger than we're gonna pull off in the next couple of years probably, but we can sort of chip away at them. We can start building a community. Um, we can see how they apply at least to our specific course or courses that we may be, may be working on. Um, and for example, you know, we did, we have identified tools that work and we have found ways to work within our limited resources. One thing we've also done, which I actually was surprised how effective it was, and it's been a good organizational tool as well, is just establishing an online presence. We've actually had people, a few people, contact us almost, you know, with, within a few months of it being launched, and there was really nothing on there, but it was people who were curious what we were doing. I had someone from Poland write me, um, which I thought was incredible. Um, but um, he saw this and thought we might have a bigger program than we do. And we weren't trying to pretend we had more than we did, but we were just saying, hey, look, what we're, try we're trying something here. We're reaching out. And this is available for anybody at LMU who wants to participate. It's not, we don't see it as our site. I manage it. We, we put um, information into it, but, but we, it's open for everyone. And it's, for me, a great outreach tool. So when I speak to pr other professors on campus who've started to show interest, I can say, please go here and realize this is your community as well. Yeah, um, you know, very early in this process, I realized I was never going to teach a class called Introduction to Digital Humanities, and I'm really glad I didn't do that and come here to talk to you about it today now that I've heard Ryan speak. Um, so uh, I was, we were going to set a, we were going to build a class around my traditional area of scholarship, the 18th century, um, and we were going to set ourselves a very modest traditional goal, which is, um, how, can, how can digital tools help us do work that we're already doing in the 18th century? And how can we build um, uh, materials that we would have on that website which would help the, uh, the, the undergraduates in the class, and then the undergraduates in the class could build materials that would help anybody imagine the 18th century. That was the whole idea, which is like, um, we, got, we got the students to start thinking about like, well look, you know, you guys know nothing about the 18th century. Um, how about if you had your druthers and you could build a site that would introduce folks to the 18th century, what would that look like? And, uh, and all the, the digital tools we used, were, that was sort of the end goal. We've been kind of talking about this mythic uh, website that's going to appear at the end of the semester that's going to incorporate their annotated poems, their uh, text analysis. They've, we've done some kind of work with Voyant. Um,
Oh yeah, and, and then and and one thing we one thing one aspect of the uh, class was to kind of make it a comparative class to to think about the way the way in which the 18th century can help them think about our mo this con our contemporary moment historically, but also how um, concepts that are coming arising now um, can help can also um, shine light on the 18th century. I think like I can't imagine. Remediation for me is such an amazing way of thinking about Gothic, like the, the re Gothic revival. So there's so many kind of concepts coming out of new media to describe our own present moment that can help us recognize and see things and describe things that were happening in the 18th century much better. Um, so just to give you one example, um, uh, you know, my own work is, is really interesting, along with people like Kevin Gilmartin. Um, I'm interested in um, how uh, print was used as a way of creating uh, social and political networks in the 18th century and how rather than just stop that, the conservative and loyalist movement that was opposed to the revolution co-opted those sort of, those, the way, those kind of practices and the uses of those technologies and, and sort of uh, turned them for conservative ends. So one of the uh, Examples that we look at in class is the, the, the Crown and Anchor Tavern, which originates as a place where radicals, uh, supporters of the revolution, supporters before that of, of political reform, gather, read radical texts, write radical texts, and then car use the postal system to correspond with other radical groups around the country. So that is just using a communication technology as a way of, of a, as a kind of social media platform. Um, and that, that uh, when the conservatives decided that w these were dangerous practices. The place they went to uh, co-opt that was they set up, they went to the Crown and Anchor Tavern, li literally, and they said, we are going to found the Crown and Anchor Tavern, which will do exactly the same thing, uh, but we will just do it to, uh, um, for counter-revolutionary uh, purposes. And, and for, for the students, it's a really great way of saying that, like, you know, looking at how uh, social media technologies are not always utopian. It's, very, it's just as easy, and I think they're pretty aware of that now, uh, but they can be they can be repurposed in sort of uh, disturbing ways. So print culture and manuscript culture became we got went a little deeper with it in the sense of in time. Um, I have a background in rare books, and I've done a lot of research on medieval manuscripts. Um, and one thing that I'm really fascinated by is information architecture in early text and medieval manuscripts. Um, and so I just knew when we were doing this experimentation with a student who was doing independent study, and she was so wonderful and cooperated with us, and she taught us a lot. Uh, but I thought, you know, there's something here. I've done a lot of reading on this. Let's just meet and let's look at this. Let's look at the connections between the way hypertexts are done and the way med medieval manuscripts were done and structured. And notice, I mean, I don't know if you, if you heard uh, John uh, Shanahan speak yesterday, but he brought something similar up. Uh, and then, of course, Ryan Cordell brought this up as well. So I think I've, I feel a little more confirmed in my, my suspicions. Um, but we, 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 so we, we've conducted a couple workshops, one with uh, our uh, student, Allison, and then with this co current course we're teaching. Uh, and it focuses on the technology of the book and the way books are structured physically as well as textually. And we have had discussions, and the students have blogged about those connections, information architecture, the similarities between you know older texts and, and the digital um, and digital texts, as well as uh, wayfinding. That's something I'm really fascinated by, which is how do you find your way through a text? You know, if there's no page numbers, you know. So what does that say when you're in using your Kindle and there's no page numbers, which drives me insane? Uh, you know, so like how do you know where you are, and how does it affect how you read? Yeah, I thought this was you know one of the more the um, successful parts of the course is they you know I'd even gone into the course thinking about um, the digital as a kind of break a moment like a rupture you know we were in a moment of rupture and I thought you know Melanie's contribution to the course really helped us see uh, incredible continuity between the manuscript cu culture scrolling. And, and what we've got now, and, and, and also the whole interaction between the visual and the, between word and image in, in uh, pre-print. In some ways, you could look at print as 
this weird, like maybe in the long history of media communication technologies, print is going to look like the odd, the odd one out that there was because there, there's a relative shrinking of the visual. Um, yeah, and so uh, in terms of you know uh, the, the tools we used, uh, basically what we said was it has to be free, it has to be easy to use, or else we're going to use a platform that they're already using and ask them to use it for academic purposes. Um, so Voyant, which is an amazing uh, you know uh, text analysis tool, uh, is it's really easy to get the, the students up and running. They can really make some very exciting discoveries, produce new knowledge. Uh, very quickly. Uh, Word hoards the same thing for me. It's a very easy tool to use. These are all free. They're all online. Uh, Echo was freely available to our university, so we had exercises where our idea was like stop using Echo as a, as a database to find material and start using Echo as a way of asking and answering research questions. And we try to design the assignments for that reason. Um, and we also used you know, Twitter, try to get them to use that, re repurpose that. I thought it was really interesting yesterday when Katie and John were talking about their limited success on that. I think we've had that limited success. And success, and we're actually talking now that maybe that's because we're asking them to use their already existing identities to tweet. Because some of the students have said, I keep on getting feedback from my friends, like what? And, but they, some of them thought that was really positive. It started really good conversations. But I do think it might, like, that might be the reason they, they, they are reluctant to use it. I, we probably have a lower bar. I thought it was pretty successful. Because uh, they, they shared some really great uh, articles with me. Um, yeah. I just want to say one thing. In terms of my role, um, I'm an embedded librarian in this class, which kind of happened, I don't know, it just sort of naturally happened. Um, so I, I don't want to say that, that, that my role has been to, we have a lot of um, discussions in front of the students, which I think is helpful. I, I would love to have taken classes during my undergrad where you see two people like a librarian and a professor, two professors, two librarians having a discussion and we show that we don't know everything, which I think is helpful. Um, and also these tools, I, um, I do teach them, but they're not hard to teach. I mean, to be honest with you, sometimes it's like the day before, <laughs> like how to use this tool. Um, and I figured out really fast. Um, so I think they're a great place to start. And they kind of tap into, I mean, the students, um, I guess it is really important to say that, I think this has been said today, actually, um, by Ryan uh, Cordell, but they actually don't necessarily have the digital skills that we give them credit for. They know their stuff, but they don't, they actually are, are kind of jarred by having to shift platforms and or use tools for different purposes than they're used to using them. So it has been a little bit of a learning curve in that respect, but, but the learning curve is, um, it, it's short, like it, it, it passes pretty quickly. Yeah, so these are some of the things we've uh, we've learned from the from teaching the class. Um, is there any of those that you want to? I mean, I, look, I, I felt that people did really do the students. If you if you inter like, I thought they were interested. I, I've heard people saying, "Well, you know, they're not really interested in talking about digital humanities and how it's going to transform the discipline." I actually think if you pose those questions the correct way, they are very interested in that question. I've always found if you, if, if you make them realize that they are stakeholders in their discipline, in their major, I, sh I think they do care. Like, I don't think that stuff seems meta to them if you, if you talk about it. So they were, they were really interested in thinking about how this could do, like the possible opportunities this offers, the dangers it offers. Like they're, you know, I think a lot of them were, are very concerned about uh, what we were doing, like I think a lot, like I think we had to do a lot of explaining that, like you know what, Qu the quantitative always leads to the qualitative for me. Like the thing I'm seeing through that quantitative move of text analysis will always, it's a prompt that leads me back to the close reading that I, I value. In terms of um, talking about digital humanities, I think what why it sort of works for us is we don't lecture on it. It's a discussion, and we ask, we have similar questions that the students have because we are sort of just finding our way as well, and that may be part of it. We're not, we're not having, and it's not like about writing a big essay and making your argument about digital huma humanities. We leave it as, a, as an open question for the students. Did you want to say more? Yeah. I could just, okay. <laughs> so from a librarian perspective, um, this is, this is uh, where we'll end. I just wanted to kind of say how this has benefited the library. Um, and I wouldn't be standing here without this class, or it would be less likely because it actually got me my appointment as a digital scholarship librarian there. Um, 
It has also um, provided us a catalyst to move into these kinds of digital services. And I don't want to just see it as services. It's also participation and facilitation. Um, I mean, we are working together. We're facilitating something. We're creating something. I'm not just, you know, scanning something for somebody. And that's a good, I mean, not to, we, I will do that too. You know, that's very important. I'm all, I'm pro-scanning. Uh, I just, there's so much more to it. There's an intellectual side to it that um, sometimes librarians don't get credit for, as we all know. Um, we make decisions that have impact scholarship, whether we're actually teaching the classes or not. Um, it's given us, you know, um, ways to think about supporting in the future. I think um, I really appreciate the open source um, talk because it, it gave me even more ideas of how we can support these kinds of things, things that are feasible. Um, and it's, it's, it has created a stronger, I already had a relationship with the English department, I'm the liaison to the English department, but it's amazing how being a liaison to a department, you really still can feel very distant. Um, but we, we're engaging so much, I'm physically in the English department more, and I think that makes a big difference. Um, and I think the library is slowly starting to be seen as a partner in this regard. I've actually had, I've talked to other professors who I already sort of knew, I already knew, sort of had an interest in, and they started gravitating more towards this idea and working, working with the library. Um, I think that's it.